you're Shaquille O'Neal right now. You're shooting 19% from the line and the Magic are gonna go to the NBA Finals and they're gonna foul you every fucking time until you prove you can th shoot 35%. We don't need you at 100%. Shaq never shot 100%. We need you just a little bit better so they stop fouling you. So you stop fouling yourself and getting into pain. So we just need to get incrementally better, little by little. And again, it's not an all or nothing approach. This is a step-by-step -step process. Dave is one of these guys that is currently fucked up and we are gonna try to rebuild Dave Tate. You know, over the years, trashing the body, doing world-class things under the bar, it takes its toll. Dave's dealing with some big orthopedic issues and after going through some of his medical history, some of his training history, and his current training status, we have some work to do. That's why I'm here at the Elite FTS headquarters and we're gonna be spending an entire day assessing, evaluating, and getting a game plan to move Dave Tate forward. All right, so that was a couple hours of testing. Mm -hmm. You will bet. <laughs> couple hours of testing, all for three key things that I wanna kinda of review right now. You and I were talking, we could throw shit up against the wall, 150 different strategies at a time, see what sticks, but that's not how we're gonna get results long term. The way that we get results is we find the linchpin. The linchpin is the one thing that we can improve right now that can have carryover in many different aspects of the way that you're moving, the way that you're living. So what's that one thing that we can work on? For you, we have two or three, knowing very well that we're gonna manage this over a longer period of time. Those things, and how do we implement them into programming? Uh, really, we wanna put together a program that is gonna be self-sufficient for you, where you don't have to go in and get physical therapy five times a week and an additional two Cairo sessions, and an additional three massages, full-time recovery sessions. That's not what we're looking at. We're looking at programming in the right movements, the right strategies, in a holistic approach, so we can get the most out of what you're already world-class in, which is having a relationship with your body and training hard. We want you to train hard, but in the right ways. So the, the big things that we correlated from the subjective conversation to the functional movement screen, to the orthopedic assessment, and then our continued conversations are really threefold. We're working on hip stability, bilateral hip stability. Right is gonna be a little bit more of our focus, but again, because of the pelvic structure, because of the lumbar involvement, we're gonna be working on global hip stability and more so lower quadrant stability. So that's really our, our number one. The way that we're gonna get after that hip stability is not just by looking at the fucking hip. We're gonna be going up into the, the torso. We're gonna to be looking at lat activation. We're gonna be looking at training the lats for eccentric control, for hypertrophy, bringing in the upper back, trying to train around that shoulder. And more so, I want to activate the glutes. Mm -hmm. I hate the word glute activation because it's bullshit. If you just kind of tap the glutes and you go in there and you say, oh, squeeze harder, squeeze harder. There's a reason why people have trouble activating their glutes, and it's usually not the glutes' fault. What we saw with you with the single leg stance and many different times today is that we lacked that adductor component to your single leg stability. That was like a glaring weak link over and over and over again. It was a weak link in the compensation when you're rotating your spine, extending your spine, when you're in single leg stance, when we were doing half kneeling balance. Over and over again, we saw the same thing. So when we're looking at linchpins, the same thing that we see over and over again, that's what we're focusing in on. So we're gonna try to restabilize your single leg movements, try to reintegrate them back into your programming and have that carry over into your posterior chain activation and stability. It's not the other way around. Many times we go in, we try to just work on the glute and the adductor on the opposite side of the leg is the thing that's holding it up. Uh, from getting better. So we're gonna go, we're gonna try to activate adductors. We're gonna do that through a lot of single leg based movement. We're gonna open that up. We're gonna open up that motor control gap and try to close that thing down so we can get more active control on some of these movements. And we're gonna try to look at that all with the focus of trying to go in for more hip stability. That makes sense? Yeah. So that's number one. Number two. This all kind of goes together too. The body is an intertwined unit of different components all working together. 
So the big issue that we know, it's a pink elephant in the room, is we got some shoulder issues. We got some huge amounts of restriction there. We have five degrees of external. We have two degrees of internal. We have 40 degrees of elevation. We have extension. We're not gonna worry about what we don't have. We're gonna use what we do have. So with extension, we're gonna use that extension moment to try to open up your thoracic spine and more so for you, your thoracic cage. We saw in different positions that your spine actually does extend. When we kind of chilled your shoulder out a little bit, we got you into that quadruped position and we kind of down-regulated your sympathetic response a tiny bit, I was able to get you through and rotate. That looked good. The T-spine was rotating. The rib cage was still like this. The rib cage didn't know what to do because you had muscles from all different angles just holding on for dear life. And really, the, uh, we were talking about it in the gym before, but I think the key to all of this is gonna be able to have better control of your lats, be able to strengthen hypertrophy your lats, but my big thing will be eccentric control of your lats so it can gain tension, maintain tension, and be used as a primary stabilizer on your big compound movements, but even with your mobility and your activation drills, the things that we're gonna do with your dynamic warmup, and also the things that you're gonna do on your recovery-based sessions. So when you think about the lats, it's the biggest, broadest attaching muscle in the body, has the most potential to create stability throughout the two deficits that you have, linking the shoulder with the hips. So that's something that we really, really want to focus on. You know, you can activate every tiny little muscle. We can get into your infraspinatus and try to activate that thing and then go into the teres minor and try to activate that thing. Fuck that for right now. What we're going to do is take the big items on the list, the low hanging fruit, so to say, and we're going to improve upon those items. And then when we get into the more minor details, they're going to work better because they have a base to stand on. Yeah. So really the number two is going to be twofold. It's going to be posterior chain, upper quadrant, stability, doubled with T, spine, cage mobility. We were talking about it a little bit in the gym, but we need to be careful that we're not just cranking your shoulder in and out of rotation, putting it into these symptomatic positions. Because again, it's just gonna cause pain, it's gonna cause a sympathetic response to your system, and guess what, you're already in neural lock there. We cause more pain into the system, it locks down even more. That's why some therapies could open you up for a second or two, but as soon as your body knows what happened to it, it closes down even more. So you know, instead of force feeding that stuff, we're gonna try to go up chain, work on that T-spine, T-cage, and be able to have that scap moving a little bit better, being able to control the scap, being able to work the scap in order to take all of that pressure off that shoulder. So we're really looking at origins versus symptoms here. We have symptoms in the shoulder. We got some fucking origins there too, but we also have some dysfunction and some things that need improvement on the backside that will help improve your day-to-day -day over here on the shoulder. And all this stuff's intertwined. Um, I mean, with the rotation that we saw at the neck, with um, a lot of this just lighting up as soon as you went to compensate, just this posture in general, it's all together. But if we can down-regulate all this, we can up-regulate the activation here, that means that the scap's gonna be able to work better. We're gonna be able to just take some of the daily pressures off that shoulder and get it into a position where the muscles can work as well as they possibly can. You can continue to do what you wanna do and we can kind of clean up some things that even if we add a couple degrees of controlled mobility back in there, it's gonna be a world of a difference for what you wanna do. So that's number two. And really number three is more global. I'd say that just generally conditioning like an athlete, preparing to train like a high performance athlete, doing our accessory work like a bodybuilder, having our marquee strength lifts still in the program that are dialed in in terms of what best fits your anthropometrics and your current needs in orthopedics right now, dialing all those things in together in more of a holistic program, more of a well-rounded program for general fitness that's putting first things first. That's getting a little bit more pain free so you can live at a higher level and then transfer that back in to the gym for the next three decades. Mm -hmm. So that's something right now that doing things that have some novelty. 
you know, we started this conversation earlier on this morning. Were you doing any rotational work? No. Any single leg work? No. Any uh, carry work? Mm -mm. So all these things, I, I truly believe that every well-rounded program, it has six foundational movement patterns, squat, hinge, lunge, push, pull, carry, and then we have to be doing some cardiovascular work in terms of the aerobic system and the aerobic system, anaerobic system. So bringing all these things together, interplaying into a well-rounded program, I think that just the novelty factor alone is going to allow us to really move forward pretty quickly. With the carry aspect, we're dealing with fake hips. I, uh, I, I say carry loosely, and um, I, I say carry because it's a very simple term, but really what we're thinking about here is training locomotion. You gotcha. We're training locomotion, and for you specifically, we have these two uh, surgically replaced hips. The best thing that we could possibly do to link up shoulder stability, dynamic hip stability, and isometric core stability simultaneously is being able to control a weight through space. And that is something that we've used as a corrective exercise tool, even though it doesn't involve a BOSU ball or a fucking band. It's something that if we can control these things and cross link the shoulders with the hips through the core, we allow more of a, more of a re-education of how we actually want to move. And when we think about um, very joint friendly things, there's really nothing more joint friendly than being able to walk through space in a neutral position at the shoulders, the hips, and the core. So that's something that we're not going to load 600 pounds on a trap bar and test you today. Yeah. What we're going to do is we're going to grade it up and we're going to be able to hit key milestones with your carry capacity in terms of testing. Um, you know, because you never went through a, a true rehab process, really the discharge number for me on, on loaded carries is being able to carry 50% of your body weight for 30 seconds in a hand. So you have, say, 300 pounds. That means that you're carrying a 75 and a 75, and you're walking for 30 seconds. Now, how does that play into joint impact? Because every time the foot leaves the, so the ground, the execution. And then the execution is very, very important here because every time somebody hears loaded carry, my, my mind goes to like Maurice Pujanowski and he's like carrying a truck through space and world's strongest man. It's not a speed game. It's a control game. It's a quality game. So being able to be smooth, slow, coordinated with your movements, that's something that should be able to be graded with very, very low joint impact. And for you specifically, um, with uh, some OA problems throughout the body, um, repeat exposures to low level joint stress, that's something that's gonna actually play into improving your capacity through um, you know, just long-term joint health. Okay. It's not something that we're gonna have you go walk for two hours with, but just as uh, we need to create some resiliency on the big strength lifts, we also need to create resiliency and some repeat loading through low amplitude based movement, which would be like a gait cycle. Got it. How's that sound? Fine. So really the next steps for us right now is it's all well and good to talk about this stuff. This is theory right now. We saw some real world implications out in the gym in the testing. What I wanna do is actually get through get a strategy going, have uh, a number of movements that I want to teach today. I want to be able to go in, teach them, and see how they interplay into the programming. The programming itself, I think, is going to be a back and forth conversation that's going to take a little time just to really truly fine tune it. But I want to see where all this theory leads and actually seeing some gym-based approach movement, the way that you've been training some of these movements uh, you know, we're not having you with the shoulder width apart, feet facing yeah, yeah, forward yeah, with I your squat. It, so. We're going to get you positioned where you feel comfortable, and we're going to see how you're moving from here. We're going to test through those six foundational movement patterns, and we're going to get a very good understanding of what's the hardest thing that you can do well in terms of throwing in some of these more novel movements into your training program to just bring it around. But really, what, what I want to do is be able to have something with between 12 and 15 minutes that you can get through that will prepare you fully to train. We don't need to be spending 45 minutes on prehab. That's fucking ridiculous. Most people can get through in six minutes. Some cases need to double that up. You know, 12 to 15 is what we're looking at. 
but everything that we're doing needs to have a rhyme and a reason. If you don't know why you're doing a prehab exercise or an activation drill and you don't know the carryover, we're not using it. We need to see something, we need to test it, we need to see how it improves a foundational movement pattern. And those are the things that we're gonna keep into programming. When we think about the, the preparing to train process, it's all about repeat exposure. It's about the compound effect of doing the shit day in, day out, and getting good at a new motor skill. You're Shaquille O'Neal right now. You're shooting 19% from the line, and the Magic are gonna go to the NBA Finals, and they're gonna foul you every fucking time until you prove you can th shoot 35%. We don't need you at 100%. Shaq never shot 100%. We need you just a little bit better so they stop fouling you, so you stop fouling yourself and getting into pain. So we just need to get incrementally better, little by little. And again, it's not an all or nothing approach. This is a step-by-step -step process. And again, we're using training as our modality here. Training as our modality is a slower moving process on a day-to-day, -day, but it has more longevity because you're building the skills with self-sufficiency. You're not depending on somebody else to feel good. You're creating those skills on your own. And that's something that once you hone, you have it for a lifetime. So I wanna go into the gym. We're gonna get you going through the squat. We're gonna look at your deadlifts. We're gonna go in. I'm gonna test some single leg stuff. We're gonna set you up into a split squat. Uh, we're gonna get you on the bench. We're gonna be looking at some of your uh, row-based movements, your pull-down based movements. And then I'm gonna actually do some, uh, some gait cycle assessment as well and see what kind of, uh, kind of movement capacity issues we're dealing with. All right, before you shut the cameras down, I guess I can make a point is throughout this whole series, and I don't know when this, what I'm gonna say is gonna come out throughout the series, my silence is not non-compliance, it's me learning. So I think sometimes when people are trying to learn from other people, they spend too much time trying to tell the other person how great they are or how much they know. So I want that to be known because I haven't, there's gonna be very little audio on my recorder because I haven't really said a goddamn thing. So you need to understand the reason yeah. I, I'm not talking is silence is compliance. If you're trying to learn, learn. And that's why. I'm used to this. this is, these are usually tough conversations I have with lifters. Um, we started today. Usually it's a shit fucking day if somebody's calling me up, they're emailing me, and they're trying to revolutionize what they're doing in their training program. I know that. And it's kind of a tough place to be in the industry because everyone wants to be the coach where everything's amazing, everything goes good, you bring the guys in, but that's not realistic. Most of us, we got sought out because shit's hit the fan some sort of way. You can't compete anymore, you got pain problems, you're plateauing, whatever it is, usually that's the kind of people that come to us. And I think honestly, that's the kind of people that come to most trainers, most physical therapists, most strength coaches, if everything's going good, why would anyone ever come to you? Yeah, exactly. By that last, that second last rep, we could really see some moving parts that weren't present on the first, second, and third reps. So that's all stuff that, again, on an assessment standpoint, yeah, we're gonna compensate, we're gonna hit compensation when we're training hard and training heavy, but we wanna know what's the first compensating thing that hits. 